welcome to the Weekly Skeptic, episode 79. I'm Nick Dixon, here with the universally loved Toby Young. Coming up, Lee Anderson defects to Reform UK, the royal photo conspiracy, and could Boris make a shock comeback? Plus peak woke and extra content for our brilliant subscribers at basedmedia.org. And speaking of those brilliant subscribers, we had our first ever Zoom call q and It was actually really good, especially for the first one. And that is now up. If you're a paid subscriber, pay five pounds, you'll be able to get the full call on basedmedia.org. Not quite the full call because we also did an extra, extra secret bit where we did questions without even recording it. So if you pay £10 a month, you'll be able to be part of the Zoom call and get in the extra secret secret gang. So uh, yeah, basemedia.org for that. Toby, anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, if, if you're not already a subscriber, just go to basemedia.org, click on sign up and you can become a premium subscriber for as little as £5 a month. Um, but if you're already a premium subscriber, a £5-pounder, and you want to uh, participate in the next Zoom call, um, then upgrade to a silver member, a £10 a month subscriber, and you can participate in the next Zoom call, which will be in about three weeks. And you can ask Nick or me anything you like. But as a premium subscriber, you'll be already be able to see a recording of our most recent one, which we did last week, which is now up in the premium section of the of the website. All right, yes, yeah, so I go to basemedia.org for all those features. And Toby, we've got to address something first, which is you had a, a kind of a pile on on X. It was quite unfair, actually, but it was it was kind of ridiculous on 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 many sides to to quote Trump. So we'll have to clear it up now. So what happened was you posted a an article from the Daily Skeptic, and what people don't realize, and there's no reason they should realize, is that these sort of auto generate from the Daily Skeptic. So you posted an article from someone you actually didn't agree with because you like to represent different opinions on the Daily Skeptic, but it then posted to your X account. So people just thought this is Toby's opinion. And you've been in trouble for this before. And I have said to you before, it's not the greatest idea. There was one where someone quite new was at the company and they posted something that was not sort of your values. And then people thought that it was, and you took it down. So this is a bit of an issue. So it was a kind of perfect storm. And people obviously hadn't listened to our podcast where it was about Sam Melia, I should say, where we actually defended Sam Melia or at the very least defended his right to free speech and to not go to prison for two years because of stickers. And we were pretty unambiguous about that. In hindsight, I think it was actually on the paywalled content. So people would have to go and be a paid subscriber, which they probably wouldn't if they're just a casual observer. But the point is, we were very clear on the Sam Melia issue and the free speech union even offered to defend him. So it was actually quite unfortunate that this is what you got attacked for. But to be fair to those people, they, they had no idea that this was not your view and you're not just tweeting as yourself. So, but, so that is a bit silly in a way to do that, in my opinion. But to be fair to you, they then all piled on, not realizing some of them that, you know, these are all the sort of right wing accounts on X. Some of them not realizing that you, FSG was actually helped out their, their friends, I happen to know in certain cases, and would help them out in a, in a jam as well, almost certainly. So it's also quite silly that they're all piling on you. This is the free speech union guy and look at what he's doing. When actual fact, all you were doing was, was posting an article on Daily Skeptic. Now they'll say, well, why were you posting that article? And where's the counter article defending Sam Melia? And then there was this extra thing about, no, the FSU didn't really reach out to Sam Melia and, and, and his wife was posting uh, that it went quite differently. Laura Towler, I believe, it's, it, apparently it's what his wife says, let me tell you something about Toby Young, he emailed Sam a couple of weeks ago saying they wouldn't normally get involved in cases where a conviction had already happened. But due to the response and backlash to this case, he would take a look. He asked to be put in touch with Sam's solicitor, which Sam facilitated. We never heard back after that. And Sam's solicitor wasn't contacted. Why the change of heart? Who is paying you, Toby? So do you want to address any of this stuff, Toby? Yeah, well, as you say, I think the source of the confusion is that whenever an article is published on the Daily Skeptic, which is six or seven times a day, um, we use this um, software called Buffer to print a little blurb flagging up the article and including a link to the article on various social media accounts, including my X account, because I have 275,000 followers and it would be crazy not to take advantage of that reach to try and promote the content on the Daily Skeptic, but but it's not it's not, they aren't actually emails that I personally write. Um, but you know uh, that's no excuse. I have to take responsibility for them. But this one did say, you know, it didn't say that this was my opinion. It was clearly indicating this was an article that had just been published on the Daily Skeptic by someone called David Hansard, who was defending the conviction and sentencing of Sam Melia. But people 
you know, um, put two and two together and made five and just assumed that I was defending Sam Melia's conviction and sentence when I wouldn't defend it. Um, anyway, um, as you say, um, and as his wife confirmed, we did reach out to him um, when he was convicted, but before he was sentenced um, to see if he wanted to appeal the conviction and um, if he wanted the Free Speech Union's help. And he suggested uh, we contact his solicitors. Uh, and this is where his wife has got it wrong. We did contact his solicitors uh, and they didn't reply. And today I asked one of our legal team to send the same email again and say, we sent this to you two weeks ago, three weeks ago. You haven't replied yet. Does that indicate you're not interested or did you just not receive it anyway? So it remains to be seen. Um, maybe they just didn't receive it, but we certainly did contact them and we've now reached out to them again. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my, my general view of this case um, is that it might be quite difficult to successfully appeal the conviction. Don't know, haven't seen all the details yet, but a lot of people misunderstood why he'd been convicted. So some people thought he'd simply been convicted for being offensive. Not so. Some people thought he'd been convicted um, for um, uh, putting up various stickers which said fairly innocuous things. And they've quoted some of the innocuous things like, it's all right to be white. Um, I don't know whether they were um, presented as evidence in the case against him, but they certainly wouldn't have been sufficient to secure any conviction. He's been convicted of two offences. One is conspiring to stir up racial hatred, which is an offence under the Public Order Act 1986, I think. Um, and um that's why. So Brendan O'Neill in his piece complained that the police had um, presented as evidence things like an Oswald Mosley poster found in his house, you know, as though his own private thoughts and opinions he was expressing behind closed doors were being taken into account. Well, they they were part of the case that he was intending with these stickers to stir up racial hatred. And the stickers in question were... Um, much more inflammatory and contentious than things like it's all right to be white. So one was a picture of a kipper. Um, and I think the slogan was small hats, big problems. Um, but there was there were, there were there was stuff which was, you know, um, even more egregious than that. Um, not saying he should have gone to prison um, for um, uh, wanting to put up those stickers. I'm not sure he even did put up any of the stickers. I think he was encouraging other people in his network to print out and put up these stickers. And that was the second charge, conspiring to commit criminal damage because the stickers were being placed on public property. I mean, it does seem pretty flimsy, but it's not quite as flimsy as the way uh, some of his defenders um, uh, imagine. Um, I mean, my general view is it might be quite hard to appeal a conviction if they can show that he did indeed intend to stir up racial hatred, regardless of whether he in fact stirred up racial hatred. In order to secure a conviction, you only need to show intent. And that does seem to have been, you know, his intent uh, when encouraging people to put up some, not all, but some of these stickers, the more inflammatory ones. Um, uh, but in addition, um, uh, 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 sorry. So, so, so I, we'll see. Maybe it will be possible to to appeal a conviction if if we think it is. It will definitely help. Um, but um, more generally, my position is that we should have something like the First Amendment in this country, and um, people shouldn't be prosecuted for speech crimes unless it can be shown that what they said was going to lead to imminent lawless violence and. That standard certainly wouldn't have been met in this case. Um, that's a long term campaigning objective. Um, politically, it doesn't seem at all feasible at the moment, particularly if uh, Keir Starmer wins the next general election and then wins a second term. Um, but that is a long term objective. We, we don't make a big issue. We don't campaign against the stirring up offences in the Public Order Act, um, you know, mainly because one of the kind of um, the enemies of free speech on the other side of the aisle argue that you're only defending free speech because you want to defend racists and 
homophobes and anti-Muslim hatred. Um, and those are among the three three kinds of speech um, uh, criminalized by the Public Order Act. Those are the stirring up offenses. Um, you know, if we were to campaign for the repeal of the stirring up offenses, I think it would it would make it much easier for our enemies to cast the defenders of free speech as just people who wanted to defend racism, homophobia, anti-Muslim hatred, which wouldn't be a good way of um, advancing the cause of free speech. But my general position is that no, no one should be prosecuted for putting up even the inflammatory stickers that Sam Media put up, regardless of intent. The critical test should be, did they... Were they like? Were they overwhelmingly likely to cause to lead to imminent lawless violence? And they clearly weren't. What about this extra thing? I've just found this from Sam's wife. Uh, she's accepting here that you may have contacted the solicitor and the email got lost. But she says, however, saying he indicated he didn't intend to appeal is completely false. You can even see that Sam has attached a document called "appeal" to the email. Yeah, I got that wrong. Um, and when I checked with um, my legal team today, um, they said that um, he 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 it wasn't it wasn't completely clear, um, but um, uh, he clearly was interested in appealing, and that's why he referred us to um, his uh, his legal team and why we contacted them. Um, okay. Interestingly, one thing that did come out is that he thought the judge had been quite fair. Uh, I mean, he his praising the judge and the judge's remarks during the trial led us to think he was ambivalent about whether or not to appeal. Um, but um, he thought at that stage, this was after he'd been convicted, but before he'd been sentenced, that because the judge, in his view, had been quite reasonable um, during the trial, um, that therefore he would only receive a light sentence. And I think he was shocked when he was then sentenced to two years. Yeah. Okay. Well, so there we go. Hopefully that clears it up for people. I mean, I said Toby's not going to be lying. I actually didn't post about it except for replying to some people because I thought it was actually going to make it worse because you were trying to explain what happened. And it, once people are angry on X, it just makes it worse. So I was like, let's just let this blow over and deal with it on the podcast. It was annoying because we defended him on the podcast. You clearly took Brendan O'Neill's view and the spiked view, not the view of David Hansard in your in the in Daily Skeptic. Now, some people suggested rather meanly that this was you trying to cover yourself. So by having this article on the Daily Skeptic, and actually there is no counter article. Our podcast was kind of the counter, but people don't necessarily listen to that, especially if that bit was paywall, which I later realized. But they're saying you're hedging your bets by having that, and that can be your kind of public position, and you can sneakily you know, have some other position in secret maybe, but you've got David Hansard sort of running cover for you. I don't think that's what it is at all. I mean, that's that, that's what I've seen people saying, but really it's just that you publish a range of views, even ones you don't like. Now, some people said that went too far. They're like, well, hang on, this guy's the, the opposite of free speech. He's saying this Sam Miller deserves to go to prison in, and the alleged free speech sort of website, free speech guru, Toby Young, is saying this. So do you think there's a line where you shouldn't even publish an article like that? Well, when it came in, um, it came in unsolicited. I read it and thought that he got a couple of things wrong about the case and so sent it back to him and told him what I thought he got wrong and um, he then produced a second draft in which he addressed those criticisms and I thought it was reasonably well written reasonably well argued um, not my view but as you say I publish a lot of things which um, which aren't my views um, and um, I thought you know um, there's been a there's been an awful lot um, uh, published condemning um the, the the conviction and the sentencing um, in our world. Let's have a counter point of view. I have asked Brendan O'Neill if he'd like to write a rebuttal to David Hansard's piece uh, for the Daily Skeptic. He hasn't responded yet. Okay, well, let's hope someone does. I mean, so at least there's that. Because I saw quite a few people saying, well, let's at least have another article mm. balancing it then, which I'm sure you would do. I mean, it was I mean, ungenerous. There, were, there was a stream of comments beneath the piece being <laughs> Very, very critical. Oh, yeah. They'll, they'll always be brutal as well. Yeah, I mean, you do this sometimes. I mean, you've upset Calvin Robinson before. I mean, you, you because you try and publish, you try and be sort of ultra fair. They don't realize you're living in this Toby world, like ultra rationalist, where everyone will see, well, this is just Toby trying to be ultra fair and publish free speech articles, you know, articles from a range of opinions. They're not, and they they don't see or any of it. They don't know it's auto-generated. They, and they assume the worst. And that, that part did bother me because FSU, 
in a way, FSU is more base than you. It's a sort of more base child you've created because you're a person with your own sort of whims or, you know, we all have our flaws. But FSU itself is this is this organization and you've created it, you know, full credit, obviously. But it, it will help all sorts of people, even if you personally, I'm not saying you do about Sam Milia, but in any case, you may have your personal qualms, but actually the FSU will defend them anyway. And that's the great thing about it. So all these kind of online accounts thinking they're so base, it's like, well, FSU will actually defend you. And also with some of them, I have to say to them, what have you done? You've got a nice account on X, fine, post some cool memes, great, which I enjoy. But actually, have you done as much as FSU? So it, it was a bit annoying for them all to just leap on you and assume the worst. And this is Toby's real opinion. Now he's out at himself. I mean, I hated the article. I don't. I wouldn't have put it up on my site, and uh, you know, and people are bound to be angry. This guy's gone to prison, and some got, someone's saying, "Yeah, he should go to prison." And you know, I, you know, it just seemed kind of gross in when we're in this culture war. And not that you have to agree perfectly with Sam Miller, but it, you know, it just seemed a, a bad article. And and you know, it, he was making a liberal the case of sort of liberal that the neoliberal system makes all the time, which is it has to protect itself, and so it rules all kinds of things out to protect liberalism, which is always a sort of paradox of the liberal hegemony. But I did think people were very ungenerous to you overall and to the FSU and tying it to the FSU just because of one article on Daily Skeptic did seem a bit mad. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's sometimes quite difficult to maintain a complete separation between the Daily Skeptic and the FSU, given that I run both. But um, certainly, I always try to make it clear that um, there isn't a connection between the two apart from that. And any opinions expressed by contributors to The Daily Skeptic are very much not necessarily my opinions and certainly not those of the FSU either. Um, but, you know, it's understandable that people uh, get confused. Do you think you should make it clearer with these really contentious pieces or not auto-generate those particular ones or delete it straight away or something or add an extra caveat or something like well, that? What I should have done in retrospect is I should have written the blurb that was going to then replicate across our social media channels when that piece was published um, and uh, uh, to make it clearer that um, this wasn't my view or the view of the Daily Skeptic necessarily and certainly not of the Free Speech Union. This was just a an alternative point of view that the Daily Skeptic was publishing on this case. Yeah. Because it's annoying, it's unfair, but people are going to go through X. They're just going to look and say, oh, Toby Young says this. They're not going to do their due diligence, most of them. They, I did, well, so I did, yeah, I so mean, what, I understand I people what, are annoyed. Go on. Yeah. And one thing I've, I've, um, I've learned over the years is that um, people, people, of course, you know, a lot of this criticism is unfair, but that's just, that's just the nature of the game. You know, on Twitter in particular, people are unfair. If people can find a stick to beat you with, if that involves kind of uh, an uncharitable interpretation or reading of a tweet, then so be it. You know, this is the business we've chosen, Nick. Yeah, there is an element of that. What, what was a bit annoying, though, or upsetting is that the glee with which they went about it, as if it was someone on the left, you know, we someone on the left does something dumb, we share it and it's like, bang, it's, it is, it's funny and it's, you know, we, we were in the culture war, but they went at you with the kind of, there's sort of a desperation to go at you. And yeah, it's fun to attack Toby. We know that, but it's it's like they, they went at you kind of as if you were sort of the enemy. And now we've got him. It's like quite a strange thing to do because the FSU has helped all kinds of people. It's not all disclosed, so they don't always know, but it's helped some very, very based people. And, and that's the irony of, I, I said it before, anyway, I'm repeating myself, but a lot of people attacking mm. you, it would help. And so it's just... And it is frustrating on that level. Well, but you didn't do yourself any favours with these, because you're so busy, a carelessly generated auto tweet doesn't do you any favours, does it? Um, the, 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 the ultimate revenge is when, I mean, mainly the people attacking the Free Speech Union are on the left, not the right. Um, and I often kind of make a mental note of the people attacking the FSU as, you know, a, 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 the, the the attack is exactly the same, but in reverse, which is that it's a kind of far right astroturf organization that's just been created to defend races, whereas the attack on the right is it's uh, essentially a kind of it's it, it's paid opposition created by the liberal establishment. Um, uh, but I have to make a mental note of people on the left attacking me like Owen Jones, think I'm Jay Rayner and think kind of, you know, come the day you'll have to ask us to defend you. Um, and that'll be the ultimate revenge when having 
having slagged us off for being a pointless organization, you then need our services. Yeah, but you are saying you wouldn't say no. You'd then say yes. Oh, of course I'd say yes. Oh, it would be, it'd be <laughs> no kind of revenge to say fuck off. No, I, 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 of course I'll, I'll put uh, the entire Rolls Royce at their disposal and just hope that they then shrink into their own guilt. I know from experience, I don't know if you've discussed this before, but when I was a drama critic for The Spectator and I um, you know, was very rude about a particular actress. So example, I said about Zoe Wanamaker, who played the Rosalind Russell role in a production of His Girl Friday, one of my favourite films. Uh, and there was a stage production at the National and Zoe Wanamaker played the Rosalind Russell part, meant to be this kind of glamorous, unbelievably attractive, recently separated, feisty, sassy reporter. And she was, I don't know, I thought far too old to play this role. And I said in my review, she should be called Zoe Don't Want to Make Her. <laughs> And um, and then I bumped into Zoe Wanamaker a few weeks afterwards, and I, I thought, oh, my God, she's going to snub me. Uh, but she didn't. She came up to me, and she was incredibly charming and said how much she enjoyed reading my drama criticism. And that just made me feel like, you know, an <laughs> inch small. I mean, it was the worst possible punishment. It was sweet revenge. And I realized that is the ultimate revenge, to actually be of service to the people that have slagged you off. It, it's difficult. But um, if you can pull it off, if you can swallow your pride and do it, nothing is more guaranteed to make them feel guilty about their original remarks. So the best the best revenge is paying all of Owen Jones's legal costs and him winning a <laughs> hundred grand self. <laughs> OK, well, you're a bigger man than me. I would uh, I would probably tell him where to go. But hopefully that has cleared that up for everyone. If anyone that didn't know what we were on about, that's probably quite a boring start to the podcast. But for anyone that did, hopefully it clears it up. We're not afraid to talk about these things. I thought it was all a bit a bit unfortunate. So that's dealt with. So should we move on and do some actual real news, which is that um, Lee Anderson has gone to reform, which was not that surprising to a lot of people. It was The writing was on the wall. But did the Tories cause themselves an unnecessary problem here? I mean, Sunak, it was pretty wet, wasn't it, to suspend the whip immediately just because he said some things about Sadiq Khan. I mean, if you can't pop at Sadiq Khan, what, what can we do? And uh, it wasn't perfect language, blah, blah, blah. They immediately suspended him. Then James Cleverly sort of doubled down that they pushed him further away. He had no choice in a way but to do this. He did a quite a good press conference, said, I just want my country back. And uh, what was funny about that is I was, I was in the at GB last night and he was there on the sofa about to go on. And he was actually chatting amongst some people. And he literally just said again, I just want my country back. I think they were sort of reviewing the things he'd said. But it's kind of like, I wonder, does, does Lee just go around saying that, <laughs> like wherever he is um, to everyone who'll listen? We all, we all want our country back, Lee, so it was a good sentiment. I personally don't know if reform are enough to get the country back at this stage. I think they're, as I've said before, a less cringe Tories. They're good. They're, you know, I like them, but are they enough at this stage? I say probably not. But still, it's a bold move. I appreciate it. It, it. I think he's done it with some authenticity. Other people are saying, well, he just thinks he's got a better chance of winning his seat there. What did you make of it, Toby? Isn't the phrase, I want my country back, um, well, Hasn't it been described in the recent past as a racist dog whistle that what it really means is I want to deport all the black and brown people that have arrived since the 1950s. So it's just white people in Britain. Um, Well, I'm sure that's the kind of thing people say, isn't it? I mean, did you see that Sky? I mean, you see that Sky footage of it, where on Sky News they were going to the press conference, and there's the um, Union Jack in the background there, just in in case there was uh, any doubt about where they're coming from or something like that. It was was really like snide words that they had the flag there. By the way, Labour had a massive flag at their conference, (laughs) but it was like just in case anyone was any doubt, they actually get it. Get this, guys. Like Britain, (laughs) it was like a really (laughs) pathetic. Like imagine being snide about the flag, just in case you any doubt where they're coming from. It's like. Oh no! Yeah, as I'm sure people have said that. Of course, they'll say things like that. But what do we? What does that matter? I can I can um, throw some light on why Rishi was so um, quick to suspend Lee from the party. Um, apparently, it's because the Conservative Party is terrified that the Equality and Human Rights Commission is going to investigate the Conservative Party for Islamophobia. And the reason they're worried about that is because the ECHR, um, is that right? The, no, the 
E H R C um, investigated Labour for anti-Semitism and found Labour guilty. And there's now enormous pressure on the commission from the left to open an investigation into the Conservative Party for Islamophobia. It's why people on the left are constantly accusing the Conservative Party of Islamophobia. It's not just the usual political point scoring. It's also because there is this pressure on the commission to open an investigation into the Conservative Party because it would be even handed. It would be evidence of impartiality. It would be fair, given that an investigation was carried out into anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. So being terrified that that might actually happen, um, they've been Maybe that I'm not saying the Conservative Party is terrified that, like Labour, they'd be found wanting. But I think even just an investigation being opened by the Equality and Human Rights Commission into Islamophobia in the Conservative Party would be a terrible political blow. So because they're desperate to avoid that, that's why Rishi was so quick to dismiss Lee Anderson, suspend Lee Anderson for saying something that could be construed as Islamophobic and cited as a reason Mm. the Conservative Party should be investigated for Islamophobia by the EHRC. Right. But the deeper problem behind that is that's just what our politics is now. It's different minority groups battling with each other and the, the Tories sort of there trying not to upset anyone. I mean, yeah, I can see that that would be the reason. But there's a deeper problem behind that, isn't it? I mean, it's just such, so pathetic that that's all our politics. It's sort of minoritarian mm-hmm. politics of grievance. Yeah, but it's per- <laughs> performative victimhood isn't it and and that's certainly one thing that Sadiq Khan is guilty of and if only Lee Anderson had accused him of that instead of um being owned by Islamists <laughs> yeah yeah and he was clumsy and all that business but now he's at reform I mean is he going to win is he going to help him win his seat there was one theory you know he'll, he'll win some Labour votes more likely than he would if he stuck with mm-hmm. the Tories and he was concerned about his seat I'm not sure I mean he didn't really have any options anyway in a way but um Unless he apologised. Now, I'm glad he didn't apologise. But how far do you think it was a cynical attempt to just win some votes in his area? Well, you mean, is he more likely to hold the seat if he stands as a reform candidate rather than an independent? Yeah, Um, or rather than a Tory, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I I think that, yeah, he clearly decided not to apologise, so his chances of being readmitted to the Tory party were pretty slight. Um, uh, I mean, I think he, I think, I think um, I would have, I mean, he said, didn't he, that his, he, one of his motivations was, I mean, he, he obviously didn't think he was going to join reform initially because he described Tice a few months ago as a pound shop Nigel Farage and was fairly yeah. dismissive of reform. And he um, said a vote for reform is a vote for Labour. So yeah, no, he definitely yeah. wasn't anticipating it. No. Which suggests he is just acting authentically from, you know, his gut. Yeah, I mean, he said that his parents had urged him. They said that they wouldn't vote for him unless he joined reform, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, uh, and he said he'd had a lot of, you know, a big mailbag from constituents urging him to join reform and saying they intended to vote reform. They wanted to vote for him, but couldn't unless he joins reform. Um, eh, may, there may have been, you know, an element of self-interest and calculation. I, I think it's... Um, to me, it feels as though uh, he's a much better fit in the Reform Party than he was in the Conservative Party. I mean, what Reform is advocating seems to be much closer to his politics than the current Conservative Party. Yeah. And so it is quite a big deal. First Reform MP, he was sworn in today, I believe. And Or is it a big deal? Or is it just a technicality, like when Bridgen was a Reclaim MP for a minute? I mean, or is it a big deal? I mean, he could even be a good leader of reform, potentially, if Farage didn't fancy it. But if Farage does fancy it, Farage, Lee Anderson, Tice, potentially Swella Bravman, Priti Patel, Liz Truss, you could see they could build, whether they call it reform or something else, they could build something there. Mm. Do you think it's a well, significant development? Richard Tice has said um, that he's in talks with other Conservative MPs. Um, and I think he used the phrase low double figures, so probably 10 or 11. Well, nine um, was being rumoured at one point, wasn't it? Uh, is it nine? But that's not double um, figures, is it? But it, nine was the f- figure I kept hearing. Yeah. I mean, th- it may be that there are, there are some more on the way. Um, uh, did you and, see Brendan and, Clark Smith, though, today ruling it out? Did he? Okay. With Good. a rather slightly amusing uh, post, he said, my statement can be found here. And if you clicked on the link, it just went to uh, Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up uh, right. on YouTube. So he was saying he's not going to leave. 
Well, I guess the uh, I guess it, 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 it does it does it does um, uh, fire a warning shot across Rishi's bows that if he suspends any more members of the party, um, they might well end up in reform. I mean, I imagine he's quite reluctant to do that again, given how this has turned out. Yeah, Mark was on GB News saying, look, he, does, he, he doesn't think they should have suspended Lee Anderson, but then he think, uh, equally, he doesn't think Anderson should have gone. This was his position. And he said, look, you've got to stay. It's a vote for the far left. He was saying to Tice, in a fairly feisty exchange on GB, he was saying it's a vote for the Labour, it's a vote for the far left. You know, you've got to stick with the Tories and a Conservative government, which is, you know, because he's a loyalist, Mog. But but what is there to stick with? I mean, what is there to stick with in the Tories? Just, just this lefty socialist party. I mean, Carl Benjamin destroyed Mog in the replies. And we love Mog, of course. He's a colleague of mine. But um, I thought Carl did a brilliant post about it, just essentially saying, what is there left that we would be voting for? What are we sticking with? He says, the problem is that there is no prospect of a right-wing government on the horizon. By almost every metric, the Conservative Party is the most left-wing government in British history. Our tax burden is unjustifiably high. Immigration is at a mind-boggling record levels. We have punitive liberal speech codes, which imprison people for posting stickers, as we've just covered. There is an almost exclusive focus on myopic minority issues at the expense of majority issues. People do not feel represented by your party and so will not vote for you. And the Conservatives have nobody to blame but yourselves. Hard to disagree with that, isn't it? Um, well. Um... Uh, did, did we discuss, I, I had an idea for what Rhys Mogg could do. I can't remember whether we discussed it, but if, I mean, it doesn't look likely now that Lindsay Hoyle will be removed as Speaker of the House of Commons, but it struck me that if he was, and that creates a vacancy, um, or if there is a vacancy in the next parliament, because I think the Speaker has to be a member of the opposition party um it, 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 jacob rees mogg should seriously consider going for that himself why because one of the big issues i think under keir starmer will be the gradual transfer of power away from parliament to the judiciary to the civil service to domestic and international organizations from elected to unelected quango crats diversity crats officials etc. Um, and um, therefore, defending parliamentary sovereignty, and in particular, defending the powers of the House of Commons will be, um, you know, a really important job. The Speaker, if they are so minded, could effectively become the de facto leader of the opposition, um, given the direction of travel under a Keir Starmer government, which will be to, to see all these powers leak away from the House of Commons. Um, so, and, and, and Jacob is exactly the right person to stand up for, you know, the sovereignty of Parliament um, and defend the constitutional role of the House of Commons. I mean, who better? Um, uh, but so I was sort of had, had that, that role in mind for him rather than leaving to join reform or running for the leadership of the Conservative Party. Yeah, that would be a great role for him, yeah, because he's such a loyalist. He's not going to leave the Tories. But like like you say, yeah, be- become a sort of de facto Tory in this weird game now we have of supposedly neutral people not being neutral. Yeah, that could be a decent role. But then do you want to be like Burkow or something like that? I mean, that was awful, wasn't it? Yeah, he was awful. Um, and Lindsay Hoyles turned out to be not great either. Um, I had high hopes for him. Um, he seemed so much better than Burko, but he failed to play them at their own game. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, what about this idea that Boris could come back via this so-called Henley plot? Now, I should have printed this out, but I think I've learned it quite well anyway. Basically, there's all these rumours Boris could come back, but he can't come back in a seat that doesn't have at least 5,000 or 8,000 or something like that majority. So they're looking for uh, the safest possible seat for him to come back in. Now, there's this guy that succeeded him in Henley who said originally said, over my dead body, would Boris t- take over from him? But he is now stepping down because of, ill health i think oh he's ill so there'll be more no, he's not necessarily stepping down but there'll be more pressure on him no i think he has said he's, he's going to step down sorry i've got that wrong that's in henley but then there's also this henley on henley and tem i think is it pronounced tame or tame or tem when it's out obviously it's the thames but henley and tem let's say how you pronounce it caroline newton who's a big boris ally she could step down there he could come in there he lives 15 miles away come straight back in that's how he could end up back as leader of the Tories, back for one last go. I mean, 
and he you know he's said to be considering it if you believe all these things and then we can also get into Cameron in a minute but what do you think to the Boris Henley plot yeah um I would have thought that if a vacancy arises um before the next general election or indeed after the next general election um I don't think Boris could sweep in and win um I think uh, he'd have a hard job doing better amongst the parliamentary party getting into the final two than um Kemi Badenoch or Penny Mordaunt um it feels like it's going to be between those two um they are the kind of people to beat um and I I just I think Boris is there's too much he, you know that there's that he's, he carries too much baggage now um uh, there's been too much water under the bridge and uh, did you watch the four part channel 4 Boris documentary no that's uh, quite Maybe good it's quite good um uh and um it's 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 not as um one sided as it might have been um uh and you know there are there are people who've been fairly close to him like his sister Rachel I'm in it um uh, and uh but but you know, you get the impression that it's sort of like it was when I saw Blair at uh, give the you know give give his eulogy at Derek Draper's funeral. Um, he it felt like you were looking at yesterday's man. He didn't feel like a coming man. It did feel as though you know this was a four part obituary um, for you know uh, Boris. Um, I just it just feels like I, I can imagine why. Of course, Boris is going to keep speculation alive. Um, he may have encouraged people to kind of fuel this rumor and passed it on that he hasn't ruled it out. It's just a way of staying in the headlines. You know, he's an attention seeking tart. And of course, he he loves being talked about and gossiped about and for people to think that he might make a comeback and could end up leading the conservatives into the next general election. But it feels to me that if uh, if if Rishi goes between now and the general election, um, which is really where Boris's opportunities would, would 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 arise, and I don't think Boris would be interested in becoming leader of the opposition. Um, if Rishi goes, it'll be because he's been deposed by a group of plotters who have someone someone else in mind. I can't. I don't think there's a there's a well organised plot uh, on Boris's behalf organised to depose Rishi and parachute in Boris. You know, the plotters have got another candidate in mind. Um, the existing plotters, anyway. So it feels like um, you know. F- 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 uh, 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 hot air to me. Hmm. Well, I don't know. I mean, they're saying he's a great campaigner, and who else have they got who could who could potentially pull it back? And just to be clear, it was John Howell, who's the current MP for Henley, who has announced he's stepping down. But then there's this revised constituency, which is the one I mentioned, Henley and Tem, and uh, and that's Caroline Newton, as I said. So this is a legitimate way he could do it. You're saying it's hot air. Maybe he's certainly got all these plans. In general, he wants to. He's always gallivanting to Ukraine. We found out he'd had a meeting with Madura in Venezuela. Uh, he, he said he thinks he can persuade Trump to, to to fund Ukraine and get behind him, which is quite interesting because Viktor Orban yesterday announced that Trump won't fund Ukraine. And actually, if Trump gets back in, the, you, the war will end in 24 hours, as Trump has predicted, mainly because Trump won't give him any more money. And it'll end like that. And Orban revealed that. I don't know if Trump wanted that to be revealed, but possibly because he's boasted about it himself. Whereas Johnson thinks he can do a role, he gets on with Trump, he can p- convince him to back the Ukrainians. In his, he said it's in his mail column. So I don't know. Yeah, any, I think, any, I think it, it, it feels to me like what, what Boris is angling for there is becoming the British ambassador to Washington. That feels like a more realistic ambition and something that could conceivably happen. Um, you know, um, uh, but if, if, if the motive for Rishi you know, bringing Boris back into the fold is that he wants him on the campaign trail during the general election. Sending him to Washington wouldn't be ideal. But yeah, I can imagine Boris very much wanting to be our man in Washington and making this as part of the case for his own appointment. Well, speaking of that, there's this idea apparently that Cameron, Lord Cameron, as we're supposed to call him now, I feel bad by because at least at least three Tory MPs listen to this podcast, and uh, I sometimes slam the Tories quite hard. And I suddenly start thinking about it now, like who could I be upsetting? But um, I'm not sure Lord Cameron listens though. But Lord Cameron is thought of as the Britain's foreign PM, so Rishi's thought of as the d- domestic PM, but Cameron's thought about as being the sort of PM abroad, even though he's only foreign <laughs> secretary. 
And uh, there's a source here saying that um, the foreign officer started referring to Cameron as Britain's foreign PM. He's the PM on the world stage while Richie does the domestic. The foreign officer's loved his revival. and It's also been warmly welcomed by all the liberals on the left. Meanwhile, Sunak has made no impact on anything or anybody. So they <laughs> poor old Richie. But I mean, obviously, I don't like Cameron in any way. He's carried on the Blair agenda. I see him as part of the the betrayal of the country and the collapse of the Conservatives. Theresa May is part of that, who just stepped down as now she was leaving as well. Um, but what's your, what's the chances of Cameron suddenly sneaking in as leader? I mean, I wouldn't rule anything out with Cameron. Yeah, well, I I, I think it's unlikely, not least because he'd have to um, become a Conservative MP too. So he'd have to renounce the peerage he's just been given. I mean, it's, you know... Which apparently it's not... he's very happy to do. He only took that to get the job anyway, and he's very happy to do that. That's what I heard. Right, right. I, 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 there aren't many examples historically of people being PM, losing, and then coming back as PM. I mean, um, uh, and I, you know, I, I also, you know, um, David Cameron said his reason for, st- I mean, he kind of contradicted this when he accepted the job as foreign secretary, but he said his reason for standing down as Prime Minister in 2016, when his side lost the EU referendum, was that Britain was now pursuing a policy that he didn't think was in the country's best interest, and so he wasn't the right man to implement it. Um, and you know, unless unless so, and that would still be you know, it, it's sort of easier, I guess, to square that circle if you're Foreign Secretary than if you're Prime Minister. I mean, you know, nothing's changed fundamentally since since he gave his reasons for stepping down. So. You know, what would be his rationale for 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 making a bid for the leadership again? Anyway, yeah, it, it's the Conservative Party's problem. Nick um, uh, is that it's bleeding voters to reform, or you know, people who voted for it in twenty nineteen, they're either going to vote for reform or they're going to sit on their hands. Not a not a huge number are going to the Labour Party. You know, people are drifting away to the right because they think that Rishi's too centrist. Um, so I don't see how replacing him with Cameron is going to bring back those 2019 voters. I mean, these are people that he couldn't attract when he was the leader at the last general election he led us into in 2015. So what, what why would people think that he's you know going to do better and win back some of those people that Boris got to vote Tory, but he didn't, you know, in 2019, no. it seems too, too much of a stretch. No, Cameron would be a disaster. Boris makes more sense, but he's the guy they got rid of. He's the, the beginning of the end for the Tories. I mean, aside from ignoring the public, bringing in ridiculous numbers of people, destroying the country in every way, carrying on the Blairite project, the fact that they got rid of Boris was the final straw, completely insane, bringing in someone else. And then that person that elected by the members, you get rid of as well to bring in Rishi, who absolutely no one likes. We do live in an elite system. Democracy is largely an illusion. <clears throat> but there is a level where, does seem to be anyway, a level where the public, the public uh, distaste becomes too great. The fact that Rishi, I think, wasn't elected by anyone. I just think, I don't think people have ever got over that, really. You know, the mm. fact that he obviously wasn't elected by the public, but then not even by the members. And everyone yeah. just looked and go, hang on, we, we Boris was the guy we liked. You got rid of him for trust. Okay, we can kind of live with that. She's trying to do something new. Okay, oh, you got rid of her as well. I don't think people have ever accepted that. And you almost no. wonder why Rishi wanted to do it because he doesn't seem yeah. to have... What was the point of it all? And, and you know, the, the conservative brand has become so toxic. You know, both sides of supporters in the FA Cup final started chanting F the Tories. You know, the one thing... <laughs> they could agree about um right. uh it it's it, 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 it's a kind of the perfect illustration of just how toxic the tory brand has become um and that's why they're facing you know um electoral oblivion um uh, and if they're going to overcome that you know you need a new face you know someone that people will pers- someone's capable of persuading people to take another look at a detested brand um, and that's not Boris. That's not David Cameron. It could be mm-hmm. Kemi Badenoch. Um, you know, she's just about different enough, not tainted enough by association with the Tory brand, I think, to persuade people think, oh, this is interesting. Who's she to take another look at the party, particularly if she sets out, you know, a radical reforming conservative agenda? Um, I think that could conceivably work. But bringing back Boris bringing back Dave, that's not going to decontaminate the brand. Dave may have been able to do that once, you know, 
in 2007, 2008. He can't do it now. <laughs> what annoys me about Kemi is not Kemi herself, who I, I, I like, but, but the way she's used as part of this whole A-list diversity thing. This post they put out, Conservatives are the party for women, with all these Photoshop-looking women in it. And I just say, can anyone tell us the party for men so we can vote for that? I mean, why would I vote for this party? It's so ridiculous. The, the whole premise of the Conservative Party, I thought, was this kind of English classical liberalism thing of like, it, that, that's not about diversity, woke diversity politics, is it? And, and Sunak in his speech tried to make this case for liberalism and sort of anyone can make it. But then he also threw in, and I'm the first non-white prime minister presiding over the most diverse cabinet ever. So they want their cake and eat it with this woke stuff. When they post something like Conservatives of the Party for Women, I think, well, okay, one, you're going against the premise of your party, as I understand it, which is English conservatism, classical liberalism, which isn't to do with with identity politics. Or if we're going there, then the kind of identities you're promoting are always specifically not my identity. It's always the party for women or the party for this and that. It's never the party for straight white men who went to a crap comprehensive and didn't get any chances. So... Why would I vote for these people? It's just constantly against me with this but diversity nonsense. Isn't, isn't the party for straight white men, um, particularly Oxford educated straight white men, um, the, the the Labour Party? Um, they've never had a female leader. Um, well, they had a female caretaker leader. That's as far as they've got. Um, the Tories have had three now. Um, and the next one, maybe a woman. Um, it wasn't the Labour Party that enfranchised women. Um, at the beginning of the last century, it was the Conservative Party. Um, they okay. They've got you know some women on the Labour front bench, but most of the biggest portfolios are held by heterosexual men. Um, you know, I would have thought that if you're looking for a, a, a male party to vote for, which doesn't seem to take women's rights very seriously as we can see with its position on the trans issue, surely the Labour Party is the party for you. Though having said that, I think this week, um, I suppose something we might address in the base department a bit later on, um, Keir Starmer did did just about bring himself to say that he doesn't think that biological women should have to compete against biological men in women's sports. Yeah, well, no, it's cool. I've said before, it's, it's based that they Labour always maintain having a straight white man as their leader no matter what. But the rest of the party is basically all minority grievance politics. It just happens that they, they've got him as leader. And they're posh men. They're not, from, well, oh, yeah, his dad was a tool maker or whatever. Okay, but I don't know. They're certainly not my party. But, yeah, they're, they're both playing the, this identity politics. It's just that the Tories are really ostensibly not supposed to, as Labour don't pretend they're not doing it. And just on everyone coming back, it reminded me of this bit in uh, Nima Parvini's book on elite theory, where James Burnham had this thing called customary right where it says, formally, a new election for any office may be held every year or two. But in practice, the mere fact that an individual has held the office in the past is thought by him and by the members to give him a moral claim on it for the future. Or if not on the same office, then on some other leadership post in the organization, it becomes almost unthinkable that those who have served the organization so well, or even not so well in the past, should be thrown aside. So, And if the vagaries of elections by chance turn out wrong, then a niche is found in an embassy or bureau or post office, etc. So... That just reminded me of a bit from elite theory that the Camerons and the and the Borises they always come back. They never once they've been there, they're thought to be key to the elite, and they just you know they never they never go away. Um, but on start, we've got to get onto the photo thing. But on Starmer and Labour, yeah, we'll talk about it later. But I, it is interesting whether Labour are going to tone down wokeness. There are some signs Starmer recognizing female sports, West Streeting saying there's a crisis of masculinity. Uh, Bridget Phillipson, I believe, saying that the person defacing the Lord Balfour painting should be punished. Will they put woke away slightly? But then again, you'll suddenly see a post where they're on about basically putting everyone in prison for misgendering. So you kind of it's all over the place. We also also came out today. Starmer wants to have a micro gang of four type situation where just did you see that a little elite group that all yes. like Blair's yeah. sofa yeah. meetings, yeah. but even more elite. Whereas Brown yeah. then said it wouldn't work, even though he was part of the Blair thing. He said that it wouldn't work and kind of mocked it and said it didn't mm. work. I think he said it didn't work for Mao or something. I can't remember what he said, but do you hear that? So that it'd be like just Starmer and Angela Rayner, which is frightening. Yeah. Pat McFadden, yeah. who I don't know anything about, and and the Chancellor Rachel Reeves, just just those yes. four. Yes, I mean, I, yeah, it was. Um, I guess like like the Quad um, uh, during the pandemic and before that, there were kind of four leading members of the coalition government uh, who met together. I think 
politically, what's unwise about that from the leader's point of view is you're giving too much power to the other people in the quad. Um, you want the opportunity to kind of, if someone in someone who's close to you, in one of the great kind of officers of state disagrees with you and is campaigning against something you're doing, you know, you don't want the decision makers to just be that small group because that gives them undue influence, particularly if they're a member of that group, much better if you're in a, in a web of constantly shifting alliances, which enable you to then isolate your opponents. Um, and that's, I imagine, partly what Brown has in mind when he says it's unworkable. You don't want to grant that much power to people like, you know, Rachel Reeves, in case she, you know, disagrees with you passionately about something and tries to obstruct you doing it. If that happens, you want to put together another little cabal and exclude her from it. You don't want a permanently established cabal of four people of which she's permanently a part. But you wonder if it's but, coming from Blair because Blair's given this leadership manual allegedly to Starmer. Blair had the sofa meetings. Is it maybe Brown's experience of those wasn't very good or he wasn't allowed in them because he's, he's, he did compare it to Mao and said it doesn't work and it hasn't worked throughout history. I don't know. What were you going to say? Oh, when you said earlier that um, Keir Starmer talks about his dad being a tool maker uh, in the same way that Sadiq Khan drones on about his father being a bus driver. It, it didn't really cut the mustard. It didn't make Keir Starmer any less part of the establishment in your eyes. I think that's that's a good point. Um, and it reminded me of something Andrew Jimson once said to me. I was doing a piece about um, why it was that um, David Cameron and Boris Johnson's privileged backgrounds the fact that they'd both been to Eton and Oxford and prep school and came from, you know, affluent, reasonably privileged backgrounds, um, it didn't count against them in the eyes of the electorate, you know, even though Labour would constantly harp on it. Um, and he said the reason he thought it was is because from most members of the electorate's perspective, there's no real difference between Keir Starmer, Jeremy Corbyn, David Cameron and Boris Johnson. They're all just posh. They don't differentiate between, you know, to them, the fact that Corbyn went to a minor private school and Boris went to a major public school is kind of irrelevant. They see them as being very much part of the same metropolitan elite. Um, uh, and, and so Labour attacks on the Tories for being posh and privileged compared to them um, always fall flat because and, yeah, in the eyes of the electorate, Keir Starmer uh, doesn't miraculously become an authentic working class hero because his dad was a toolmaker. He's Sir Keir Starmer, former director of public prosecutions and now the leader of the opposition. He's posh, you know, no less posh than Rishi Sunak, even though Rishi Sunak has hundreds of millions of pounds. So I, I, I thought that was quite a good point, quite convincing. And it yeah. sounded like that's more or less what you were echoing too. That's it. We don't divide you posh people up into little groups. We just go, yeah, yeah you're all posh. It's, yeah. it's like an Asian person once said to me, he was a Muslim who said to me, um, sort of when I was explaining class to him, sort of realised, oh, like, so white people aren't like the same. Like, he hadn't fully realised that white people yeah. were not one group, and that we, we had different groups of resentment within each other. So that's yeah. it. So I just look at it and go, no, you all, I don't know. And I don't understand you posh people do your different levels of schools. We just go, no, you're all the same to us. Yeah, that is how we see it. But they, but you're right. They always keep this, the actual straight white men, the posh straight white men, they're always still there. It's like when we were told in comedy, oh, you can't get an agent anymore because you're a straight white man. You can't have this TV gig, et cetera. And you'd be always pointing at it. What, what about all these straight white men? And they were still on the telly from the 90s. Alan Davis wasn't giving up his job. Jason Manford or Stephen Fry, whoever you want to mention. They weren't losing their jobs, and Hugh Dennis, all these people. There's just no new ones. So, yeah, Cameron's not going anywhere, and, you know, they're all still there. But somehow, but it's this pattern or it's this, you know, foregrounding of diversity and going on about it. But it doesn't, yeah, but it's fairly trivial and superficial, isn't it? And they're all mm -hmm. posh, diverse people anyway. I mean, the fact that Sunak's in there doesn't make any, I doubt it makes many working class Hindi people think, well, I can make it if Sunak has. <laughs> Do they have anything in common with Sunak? <laughs> well, the paradox of kind of, you know, paying lip service to equity, diversity and inclusion is that um, you have to do that in order to retain your place in the elite. It's like you, know, you have to pretend you know, if you're if you're if you're a privileged heterosexual white male, you have to pretend you have to kind of engage in ritual bouts of racial uh, self-flagellation and pretend you really believe in diversity and you want many more black and brown people to be in these prominent positions you have to you have to kind of that's all you have to engage in that kind of performative ritual in order to maintain your status as a member of the elite 
Um, yeah. if, if you were to defend, you know, uh, the fact that there are lots of privileged heterosexual white people in the elite, you would quickly lose your place as a privileged heterosexual white person in the elite. Yeah. You have to pretend that you find it abhorrent that you are so powerful in order to remain so powerful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one of the classic things. To actually say maybe straight white men aren't that bad is the ultimate signifier of low status. And yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. You have to be aware enough to say, oh, no, we are awful, aren't we? As we continue to c- maintain all these roles. There, there is the odd person who isn't privileged. I think uh, John Major had quite an odd background, didn't he? I think David Davis maybe has an ordinary background. There are people from ordinary backgrounds. But yeah, they do all sort of become absorbed within the posture. Thatcher, of course, you know, very similar. I mean, my dad was from Lincoln and is from Lincoln and, uh, you know, from a very humble background. So Thatcher was more like us, even though she learned elocution and all that kind of thing. She was closer. But anyway, all right, maybe I should uh, do an advert, Toby, because we've come to pretty much the end of that story, I think. And yeah. um, good luck to Lee Anderson. And I'll just do a quick ad from one of our most loyal sponsors, which, of course, is Thor Holt. And Thor says, what do you value? The reason I value coaching is because it allows me to connect with and encourage others. I get to help clients lean into their own values and deliver tangible results. Why do I pay to sponsor this podcast? Because I believe we share a value of free expression. I'm not a conservative and have no interest in any further culture war. I work with clients across the political spectrum and have no political leaning at all. This podcast sponsorship has also sent so many fascinating connections my way, such as Will. Will connected via WhatsApp initially, then made the effort to come along to the stand-up comedy gig I was performing at last night in Glasgow's West End. We had a fascinating conversation and a great laugh. To connect with me and or keep up to date with this bottle-testing comedy hobby of mine, WhatsApp me on 07906321593. Cheers, Thor. And he adds, P.S. I've committed with my comedy mentor to attempt 100 stand-up gigs, and I'm on number six. So to encourage heckle or simply connect, don't be shy. WhatsApp me on 07906 321 593, quoting Skeptic. So I don't think he means Will of the Daily Skeptic, but uh, a Will has contacted Thor there, and Thor's attempting stand up. Well, come back when you've done about 2,000 gigs, Thor, and then we'll talk. But uh, still, well done because it's not an easy thing to do. Toby's had a crack at it and did quite well, but you know, Toby's very special. And uh, I've done about 2,000 gigs, so it, to me, it's just like breathing. But it's tough when you've just started. So that is interesting that Thor's trying stand-up. And mainly, thanks for sponsoring the podcast. And all right. Maybe we could get him to be, um, you know, the warm-up act for our next live show. Oh, you or shouldn't maybe have not. suggested that idea live because <laughs> no, 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 I, can't, I can't see that working. But uh, <laughs> all right. Well, I did promise we'd talk about this story involving our beloved Princess of Wales, who released this strange photograph. So she's obviously been recovering from her surgery. We don't know too much about it. And then to sort of put everyone's mind at ease, she released a photo of her just happily there with her family. But unfortunately, it was photoshopped in a very amateur way. And uh, everyone realized it was a fake photo or certainly not fake, but edited. And the press agency said they couldn't even run it. And then it was withdrawn and all this scandal. The good news is the princess doesn't actually have a partially invisible arm and she hasn't ditched her (laughs) wedding ring. But, um, But the bad news is no one knows what's going on with Kate, Toby. Yeah, so I've got um, so three possible explanations. One, um, she did just doctor the photo herself because she was playing around with the image and wanted to improve it and um, hadn't realised that, you know, her lack of Photoshop skills would be so easily detected. It's all a bit embarrassing, but there's nothing more to it than meets the eye. Second explanation is that actually um, she's got an eating disorder. And the reason she was in hospital for an abdominal issue was, in fact, um, because she's got this bad eating disorder. And because she's got an eating disorder, she didn't want to pose for a photograph um, with her children for Mother's Day. So her press team put out a fake one, but did a bad job of faking it. Um, Third theory is that actually history is repeating itself. William, like his dad, is a bit of a shagger. She's caught him having an affair. She had a nervous breakdown. She actually went off to a sanatorium and um, not to have an abdominal operation at all. That was just the cover story. And she's now back, but struggling to forgive him um, and refused to pose for a photograph. So got her press team to fake one because she still hasn't forgiven him. Wow. I didn't even... 
See, I'm never cynical enough. Toby's always got a good insight into the cynical world. I'm just such an innocent, nice person. I never think about all these possibilities. Me there with my health anxiety, I'm thinking she's like, my theory was she's just much more ill than they're saying. There was that one photo came out where her face looked kind of different. I thought, is she on like steroids? I was thinking, okay, she's more ill. She's too ill to do a photo. So that's why my mind goes. But you've gone towards eating disorder, which could make sense because she is very slim. I feel bad speculating on the princess's uh, potential eating disorder, especially as this is the princess we actually like uh, and respect. But I feel bad. But uh, and then I, the shagger theory, that's completely new to me, being such an innocent person. I never thought of that at all. But that is possible that she's just having a, yeah, a big I, tip I, with, with old Willie. Yeah, like father, like son. Um, but I should say that um, actually, when I was discussing this with my wife last night, she was saying, well, no, Charles wasn't a shagger. Um, isn't a shagger. Um, it's just that he was always in love with Camilla, and that's why his marriage to um, Diana went tits up. Um, and this would be a slightly different um, uh, hypothesis um, that William doesn't have someone like Camilla in the background who he's been in love with forever, um, and and Kate's just discovered this. The theory is that no, he's just a bit of a shagger, and she's discovered that. But I'd say I'd only. I think um, if I was going to attach a probability to these three different hypotheses, I'd give a seventy-five percent probability to the first innocent face value explanation, maybe a twenty-five percent probability to the eating disorder one, and only a five percent or less probability to the shagger theory. Well, what's the shagger theory got behind it? Is there any actual evidence? It's just pure posh rumours. Bit of, bit of speculation in uh, in royal circles. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah, well, you're right. Prince Charles was just in love with one person, although there's also those rumours he was actually in love with a different person, not even Camilla. I've forgotten her name now. So maybe that is even more complicated. But but yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure about that one. I, it's dangerous to speculate. But I'm not convinced by the official story at all either. I mean, Kate messing around. I mean, Mog thought she was just taking the fall for a staff member in a very noble way. That's possible. But it's also possible she was just messing around with Photoshop. But that doesn't really explain many other things. Like, why not just come out and do a quick video? Uh, uh, that would end all rumors. Why not do a different photo? You know, it. It. Mm. Why was? Yeah, it's just too much. It's too much. I mean, I thought she was just more ill than than we'd think. I mean, why not just come out in most of these scenarios and just do a quick video? Well, I would have thought Except that the if eating she... disorder scenario, you could do the quick video in almost any scenario. Well, one reason for thinking that, um, actually, she was the person who manipulated the photograph is that if she'd entrusted that to her PR team, they would have done a much better job. It would have been much less obviously detectable. Um, And they would have been aware of the risks of submitting a manipulated photograph to a press agency, a photographic agency. Um, So therefore, more likely explanation is is that she did it and she gave it to her team and they didn't look twice at it they just they just didn't think for a second she would have manipulated the image didn't look at it very carefully just distribute it in the normal way um but why would she have done that well obviously because um well it may be that she just wanted to improve the photo that she took with her children she that's possible uh, but more likely is that she didn't want to she didn't want to pose for that photo so she she herself pulled a photo together um uh from you know using images from different different from elsewhere uh it was like a you know patchwork quilt um and um but but why would she do that well you know um that's where it gets kind of uh murky and speculation mm. is rife tom bauer thought william took it he says william's just headstrong he likes yes men around him he doesn't really listen. He did, it was his idea. He took it and said, let's just release this against palace advice. That's one theory. Um, another but theory. Then what, what's uh, the, but then who manipulated it in that theory? Well, in his theory, Kate still manipulated it. William took it and Kate just touched it. Well, I think it we know. We, I think it's always claimed that William took it. Right. Um, that's, that's, yeah, that's part of the kind of. But if it's manipulated, story. maybe no one took it. It's just felt pieced together from different. Oh, I see images. what you mean. Oh, that he actually took the photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and the people are looking at it online and going like, this is, it's from her Vogue cover from two years ago, whatever it is, with this, with it, and they're putting it together. And other people are replying, that's just her face. And other people go, no, it's the exact smile and the exact thing. And other people go, that's because that's how she looked. But it, there is some, uh, you know, reasonably compelling arguments that it's, it's, it's a cover from certain magazines. You take it, you put it in. Yeah, because it certainly doesn't look anything like that other picture that came out of her face recently. They've now released another one of her leaving the pack to try and like, you know, quell rumors of her sort of leaving the palace or whatever but that's also like really vague and weird i mean why not just do so 
It's very weird. I mean, if you wanted to end the rumours, you could yeah. easily just show up and do something normal. So there's a real it feels reason like, why yeah, she It can't. does feel like there's more to this than meets the eye, and they're trying to cover something up, and um, it's going to come out sooner or later. I hope it's not something really bad, because I'm, now I'm worried. I mean, like I say, this is the princess we actually like, and Meghan weirdly mm. came out in an article or someone, a source close to Meghan, saying Meghan would never let this happen. She had obsessive attention to detail with her photos, which we can all believe because she's a big narcissist and spent all her time perfectly matching Diana's outfits while claiming she didn't. I mean, of course we know Megan wouldn't let this happen. I mean, Megan's completely insane. Obviously, that's yeah. a satirical claim and not not libelous. Go on. Yeah, and um, the the in the Telegraph's piece about this, um, in which they they sort of hint pretty strongly that Megan is the source of this story. Um, they then say the intervention, that is Megan's intervention, comes just days after the Duchess just criticised women who were, quote, completely spewing hate, unquote, to other women online, calling on female executives in tech to do more to block it. Speaking at an event about women in the media in Austin, Texas on Friday, Miss Markle said she could not wrap her head around how people could have been so hateful towards her on social media. It's not catty, it's cruel, she said, of comments written online while she was pregnant. Why would you do that? And here she is engaging in exactly the same kind of cruel, bitchy behavior towards her estranged sister-in-law that she only days before was condemning as unacceptable and something tech bosses should do something about. That's not like Megan to not be entirely consistent (laughs) and fair in her reasoning. Um, Oh, well... Megan, well, that's our best guess, guys. I mean, I'm worried about the princess who we actually like and respect. And I don't even like that we've speculated about her eating disorder or sh- shagger potential of her husband. I'm uncomfortable with all of it. I suddenly get quite, when it comes to the Queen, and when it comes to Princess of Wales, I just suddenly get like, can we not just, I don't feel quite the same. About, obviously, I don't feel the same about Harry and obviously not Megan. And William, I'm not sure about yet. He wants to modernize the royal family, which is obviously an awful idea. And King Charles, I have some respect he's a king, but he is a bit woke and a bit green. For some reason, I'm more protective when it comes to uh, Kate. You can see, I mean, let's suppose that um, there is a mental health issue there. Um, and that's and that's what's really going on. That's what they're trying to cover up. You know, well, that, that, that poses a question. Well, why wouldn't they just be upfront about it? Um, uh, but maybe the reason they're not upfront about it is because William has made a huge, you know, he's made mental health his thing. It used to be his and Harry's thing. It's still their thing. It's now they just do it separately. Um, But, you know, he's supposed to be someone who is an ambassador for talking about mental health, not sweeping mental health problems under the carpet, confronting them head on, etc. So you can see it would be hugely embarrassing for him if it turns out that his wife is having an episode because of his behaviour. Um, so um, that would be that would be why they've gone to such lengths to kind of uh, cover it up and haven't just been open about it. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, that's cynical enough. I didn't even thought of that. I didn't even know it was that into mental health. But yeah, that's certainly possible. I'm still just worried she's uh, she's ill. But um, let's see. Anyway, we had to address it because it's such a massive story. Lots of royal people coming out to play it down, and royal adjacent people, which which makes me more suspicious. So that's not going anywhere for now. Let's see what happens. This podcast could age brilliantly or terribly. Um, Okay, we've done quite a long time. So now let's go. And Oh, no, let's do a quick advert, Toby. We have another ad. So this is an ad from the Live In Care Company. Are you worried about parents or a loved one who are finding it more and more difficult to take care of themselves or who may be living with a condition such as dementia or Parkinson's? Are you starting to think about a residential care home, but the very thought of it doesn't sit right? At the Live-In Care Company, we truly believe that home is the best place to receive care from an expert carer of your choice and on a one-to-one basis. Home is always a calmer, more healthy and a happier place to be. For more information about Live-In Care, please go to theliveincarecompany.co.uk. That's all one word, the Live In Care Company. .co.uk, or you can ring them for a no obligation conversation on 0118-914-5300. That's 0118-914-5300. They'll be happy to help. 
All right, well, thank you for that. But now let's go to everyone's favorite section. It's Peak Woke. So as always, Toby, we've got loads of Peak Wokes and we've got things that could actually be whole stories in here. But maybe I'll start with one that caught my eye, which was this Hollyoaks trans grooming scene. Very, very strange. There was a scene in Hollyoaks with a kind of a bloke who was trans trying to persuade a young girl, it seemed like, to to embrace her transness. And the way it was done was so creepy and weird. There was sinister music in the background. And this man kind of came up behind him and kind of, kind of lent in like a demon or like worm tongue in Lord of the Rings. I thought, this is brilliant. This is a, like a brilliant... Uh, sort of takedown of the evils of, of the sort of trans grooming attempt attempt to trans kids. Unfortunately, it being Channel 4 and Hollyoaks, we know that's not what they were doing. But if they were trying to do a satire or an attack on it, it would have been perfect. But in their minds, this was a good, positive thing, not realizing how horrific it looked to any sane person. Yes. Um, I couldn't work out when you were praising it, whether you were just pretending that that's how you interpreted it, um, uh, you know, um, uh, for satirical purposes, or that whether it, you yeah. really did think <laughs> it was uh, it was intended to be a warning to young girls not to, um, um, you know, have their heads turned by trans influencers. No, one person replied, "Go really? I just thought they were just on in favour." It's like yes, obviously they're in favour. It's Channel Four. <laughs> it's Hollyoaks. Yes, I was being satirical. Maybe I didn't crank the satire up high enough. For, for some people but yeah with autism but yeah that's what I was doing yeah it was um it's it's sometimes you think you're winning you know um we live on turf island um the Tavistock's been closed down even the leader of the opposition has said he doesn't think it's fair for biological men to compete against biological women in you know various sports when you see things like this you realize we're not winning um, you know, um, we may be winning these minor skirmishes in this particular front of the cup, this particular what theatre of the culture war. But overall, we're losing uh, because this kind of thing is still happening all the time in the background. It's part of the kind of background noise that um, most, you know, 13 year old girls are exposed to. So we need to do a lot more if we're going to win this particular battle. Yeah, and especially with the revelations about WPATH, which we might talk about in the paid section if we've got time, but Andrew Dawes has done a whole show on it on GB News, and it is absolutely shocking stuff. Um, Toby, what have you got in Pete Woke? So, um, absolutely um, horrific one. Um, uh, let me just find it. So, Newsnight, um, uh, so in, a, in a 2016 uh, segment... I think it was um, it was called um, uh, To Hell and Back, the story of a Syrian family given refuge in the UK. Um, uh, and um, and, it, and it was uh, it was about these uh, two Syrian brothers um, and, it, it, and it documented their journey from Syria to Newcastle. And during the production, the BBC became aware of criminal proceedings against one of these brothers who was then aged 18, who'd been accused of sexual assault by a 14 year old girl. And the trial lasted two weeks and he was acquitted. And former Newsnight journalist Katie Razzle subsequently interviewed the two brothers and their parents in the aftermath of the trial. And um, she actually uncritically allowed one of the brothers to say, I felt she, the accuser, didn't want foreigners in this country. And that is why she made up the whole story. So Razzle didn't challenge that. And instead, she added, that believes Omar Badruddin was at the heart of the case against them. Um, uh, and then in a voiceover, Razzle says, the Syrian men in many ways appeared less sexually experienced than the girls that they were supposed to have attacked. I mean, absolutely extraordinary. In this documentary, uh, on Newsnight, Katie Razzle, the presenter, essentially gave credence to the view that this girl had falsely accused these uh, two Syrian brothers um, because she was anti-immigrant and that in many ways, Katie thought she was more sexually experienced, 14-year-old, than this 18-year-old boy she'd accused of sexually assaulting her. Well, 
fast forward um, uh, nine years, and these two brothers have just been convicted for multiple rape of a 13-year-old girl. Omar, the Syrian refugee depicted so sympathetically in this Newsnight documentary, um, was convicted of seven counts of rape against this 13-year-old girl. Um, And the victim said, and this was two years after, this was between August 2018 and April 2019, so two years after the Newsnight documentary. Um, And the victim, the the girl who was 13 at the time, said that her attackers tortured her and made her life a living nightmare and that um, Omar raped her on at least seven occasions and threatened to kill her or take her to another country if she failed to comply. So absolutely extraordinary story, but um, Newsnight and Katie Razzle did not come out of this looking good. Absolutely horrific. And it reminds me of um, Peter Oborn when he said that that victims had accepted the advances of their attackers, talking about the Rochdale sex trafficking gang, and just said, oh, what does it tell us about what's happened to our society that we have 12-year-old girls, 13-year-old girls who are happy to give up their affection and their beauty to men in exchange for a packet of crisps? It's like, really, is that the story, Peter? So uh, sort of similar to that, but on an even worse scale. I know, what is what is wrong with uh, the BBC and these people, man? It's so disgusting. Yeah, I saw that story. It's horrific. And we're, just, we're not going to learn. This is just what the liberal establishment does. It never learns. It just allows It allows a certain amount of this. The average person is disgusted by this, wants to see these people hanged, but the liberal establishment allows for a certain amount of rape and torture and and, and murder if it's from the right people, because that just that's how it has to survive, it's keep it keep its ideology going and keep the system going. Anyway, that's my take. Disgusting. Um, all right, it's almost too disgusting for a Pete Woke, but uh, which sometimes are sort of more amusing. But um, there are a few more. I mean, maybe we should do the the Lord Balfour one as a peak woke, which of mm-hmm. course is that this painting was slashed by another seeming posho. I mean, it was a pro-Palestine protester, of course, but people looked at the bag she was wearing and it seemed to be a designer bag worth about a thousand pounds new people saying 500 pounds secondhand. And this is a big, big difference. The fact that she was slashing the painting rather than just someone gluing themselves to something or a painting that has a cover on it. And we were very harsh about this on GB. It's hard for us to go further. Lewis Schaefer suggested death penalty. Uh, I might have said it as well. But the point is, we were like, it's got to be an extremely harsh penalty for these things. It's got to be prison time. You've got to set some sort of example. And interestingly, as I alluded to earlier, even Shadow Education Secretary Bridget Phillipson said they must face consequences and, and be punished. And so maybe this is a I mean, it's, just, it's it's another level of vandalism, isn't it? And, and co- last I checked, Trinity College, Cambridge, where this happened, didn't do anything, hasn't done anything. This seems to have been allowed to happen so far, but maybe I'm, maybe there hasn't yeah. been some punishment. Well, uh-huh. yeah, no, Trinity College hasn't emerged from this episode covered in glory. I think they, in the statement they issued, they described the incident as regrettable, which seemed to be a bit of an understatement. And yeah, as far as we know, the girl hasn't been punished. Um uh, and um, again, we don't the regime know. allows this. We don't know that she was, um, you know, a, a student at Trinity, um, but she certainly looked like a Cambridge student. Um, someone pointed out on X that she was wearing um, a designer backpack that retails at over a thousand pounds. Yeah. So she was she was a posho, like most of these, you know, protesters, whether they're just stop oil pro-Palestinians, white protesters are. They're, they're, they're usually privately educated, extremely privileged white women. Um, and it looks like she very much fits that bill. So chances are she was, in fact, at Trinity and Trinity still haven't announced what they're going to do with her. Um, you know, back in my day, I was at Trinity, Nick, as a graduate student. Um, people would be sent down for, you know, getting drunk and being sick in the quad. Um, but apparently she hasn't been punished yet. Um, but uh, uh, hopefully she will be. Uh, hopefully she'll lose her place at Cambridge University. Yeah, and and go to prison. So how about this one? Diversity row erupts after Alan Turing Institute's Institute, sorry, hires male scientists as staff. I mean, people are freaking out basically because some men have been hired 
on merit. And they're saying it, it showed a continuing trend of limited diversity within the, within the Institute's senior scientific leadership. Never mind the people who could actually do science. I mean, there was a time when we needed to crack the Enigma code and we couldn't worry too much about, you know, whether it was cracked by a black lesbian or not. But this is this is the state of the Turing incident. Now, what would Turing say? Yeah, um, yeah, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And what was depressing about this episode was um, a spokesman for the Turing Institute um, more or less apologised, you know, abased themselves at the foot of their diversity critics uh, for not doing more to diversify um, the Institute and hire more women. And they sort of, they couldn't quite bring themselves to say, we just hired the best qualified people for the job because they knew that, you know, that's a microaggression. Um, uh, and, and it would make it sound as though, you know, the immediate rebuttal would be, oh, so women, you didn't think there were any women who'd be qualified, you know, but clearly that's what they did. They they hired the best qualified applicants, you know, and that's what they should do. They're a tax payer funded institution. We want our best people to be working for these scientific research institutes, looking at things like machine learning. Um, we don't want these institutes to be handicapped by having to meet diversity hiring quotas. Um, you know, only they had robustly defended the decision on that basis. But no, it was like, well, we're trying all the time. We want to recruit more women. Four members of our top team of 12 are, in fact, women. It was just... Uh, I know. And that's why I put it in Pete Woke because of the backlash. But the actual event itself suggests it's part of this putting the woke away where this DEI stuff is actually perhaps retreating a little bit. You know, even though there's still the backlash, what you should do about the backlash is just go, yeah, whatever, we're hiring on merit. That's what we need to do at this point. Yeah. But yeah, so it's still peak woke, but DEI is starting to recede, I think. Uh, do you have any others, Toby? Well, it's certainly not receding in Canada, Nick. Um, uh, so um, uh, Justin Trudeau's government um, has brought forward um, a piece of legislation called Bill C-63, colloquially known as the Online Harms Bill. Uh, which is going to um, criminalise vast swathes of speech, which are presently legal, hate speech, supposedly. Um, and, um, uh, I mean, it's so unbelievably authoritarian. It's almost um, a parody. It reads like a parody when you read exactly what's what, what this bill is trying to do. But, OK, um, Justin Trudeau has said that he wants people guilty of um, trafficking in hate speech online, by which he means things like saying trans women aren't women, to go to prison for life. For life. Um, and um, in addition, this bill will grant police the power to place people under house arrest if they think there's a risk they may be about to to say something hateful on social media. So it's like um, like if, if, there, if, if, if the police decide in their wisdom that you are at risk of saying something hateful, they can place you under house arrest. Um, and in addition, um, uh, you can be sued um, for saying something help hateful by the alleged victim um, for $20,000 if they're upset by something you've said and if they perceive what you've said to be motivated by hostility towards one of their protected characteristics, even if it isn't. You can be successfully sued for 20,000. Not only that, but there's no limit as to how many people can sue you um, uh, for, for $20,000. Um, so, you know, anyone who deviates from woke orthodoxy can be placed under house arrest, um, sent to prison for life and effectively bankrupted by woke activists. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, but that's Canada for you. I mean, Canada is beyond anything you can imagine. I mean, if they actually do this, and actually start enacting these. It's minority report stuff. It's hate it crimes you may commit in the future. And it's they also had this rule that I saw Jordan Peterson and others talk about where you can get people for things they've said at any time in the past. Mm. Isn't it? There's a rule about some, some things they've said at any time online you can be done for and sued Yes, for. I think that's right. No statute of limitations. It's like right. um, uh, a gold embossed invitation to a fence archaeologist to get digging. Yeah, and 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 and, you, and do you for twenty grand and and, and bankrupt you? So anything you said in the distant past, anything you may say in the far off future, you can be done for and and arrested and fined. I mean, Trudeau said once he admired China's basic dictatorship, and he certainly wasn't lying there, was he? I mean, how is this? How is this allowed to continue? People are just going to be leaving Canada, surely, on mass. Well. Uh, hopefully 
Trudeau will lose the next uh, general election and be replaced by Pierre Poilievier. That's how you pronounce it. He oh, seems yeah. a lot better, and I'm sure he'll repeal or at least not activate this new law. Yeah, I hope so. It's just the absolute end for Canada. You, you wonder with Trudeau if he'll find some way of staying in. He's so slippery. He's sort of like Sadiq Khan in that way. He just seems to stay in despite everyone it, hating him. It made me realise the urgency of starting a free speech union in Canada. So there is now an FSU in New Zealand, South Africa, Australia. There really needs to be one in Canada. And if anyone listening would like to get involved in setting up a free speech union in Canada, get in touch. Info at freespeechunion.org. Info at freespeechunion.org. Let's get this done. Yeah, absolutely. All right. My only other one was just the Archbishop well be banging on about Ramadan. He decided to, we, we never heard him talk about Christianity, but he, he comes out at the start of Ramadan and has this weird speech saying, we all benefit from the many ways that Muslims in their diversity seek to be good citizens and contribute to our common good. It's like, in their diversity, what does that even mean? And then he went on and said, um, I'm so grateful to all of them and to all those who enrich our society. It's just funny because diversity and enrichment are sort of two of the key kind of words in all the memes that are sort of very anti-diversity. So he just, I don't know if he was deliberately using the meme words to troll us, but I said, um, this guy's going to force me to become a pagan, which is how I feel at this point. I mean, how can you be part of the Church of England? Jamie Franklin will be annoyed at me if I say we should all leave it because he said we're leaving it to the wolves. But it is, you do wonder at this point how you can be associated with the Church, or church of England. Certainly, or maybe you can and just not be associated with Welby, but it, 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 this guy's an absolute joke. I mean, There's a, a coda to that peak woke, which is, Justin Welby condemned the kidnapping of, I think, 230 schoolgirls in the latest horror um, in Nigeria. Um, And I think these were schoolchildren at an Anglican school, which is why he was commenting on it. Um, But he couldn't bring himself to say that they were kidnapped by a Muslim um, uh, group. Um, I don't think it was Boko Haram. I think it was another new, e- equally militant group of Islamists. And um, uh, he just described them as um, gangs without without identifying their um, uh, I- 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 religious convictions, um, presumably because to to, 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 to to identify them as Muslims would have been Islamophobic. What is all these people? Everyone knows what they're doing. It's who are they who are they trying to fool? They're just signaling to each other, I guess. It's just all very depressing. And, and well, well, what's extraordinary about this, Nick, um, and this is that is that you know who's contributing more to Islamophobia? Um, gangs of Islamists who go around murdering innocent people, kidnapping school children, blowing up ancient monuments, the rest of it. Or people who identify the people who've done all those things as Muslims. It's like doing all those things, that doesn't contribute to Islamophobia, God forbid. But identifying any of the perpetrators as Muslims, that's Islamophobic. You're not allowed to notice, Toby. Don't notice. There's a trend now about noticing things. There's a meme about it, but you can't notice anything or you're a bad noticer. So better not, don't notice it, Toby. Just carry on, praise the diversity. All appalling and ridiculous. There we are. Of course, I don't, you know, it's not about bashing Muslims. It's just about why is it Welby's role to, I don't know, whatever. You get the idea. I've got a headache and I, I'm done with it. It's peak woke. Anything else, Toby, on that? Uh, well, I was going to throw in the um, conflict between, the argument between um, J.K. Rowling and India Willoughby in which J.K. Rowling misgendered, quote-unquote, India Willoughby, which, as we know, means the opposite. It means she used her his correct gender when referring to him. Um, and India Willoughby was so affronted by this insult that um, he reported J.K. Rowling to Northumbria police, who, surprise, surprise, have, discovered, have decided that misgendering someone isn't actually a criminal offence. Um, and uh, But according to India Willoughby, Northumbria police have recorded this as a non-crime hate incident. Now, we don't know whether that's true or not, um, just because India Willoughby said it doesn't make it true. Um, uh, but if it is, it's pretty outrageous. Um, 
according to the new statutory guidance on the recording and retention of NCHIs, which the Free Speech Union lobbied for and was instrumental in getting through. Um, this is by no means meets the test for a non-crime hate incident that should be recorded and retained. And actually, they give examples in that statutory guidance of and of, of incidents which should not be written down and and recorded as NCHIs, and one is misgendering. Um, so it's absolutely crystal clear. So I, I, I suspect that India Willoughby is just making this up, but maybe not. Maybe yeah, w- wouldn't be the first time Northumbria uh, wouldn't be the first time a police force had recorded a misgendering incident as a non crime hate incident. And you just correctly gendering him there you would probably go to prison, as would I, under a Labour government, because there's this video from. Angela Eagle, saying Labour will legislate for a trans-inclusive conversion therapy ban, which means allow children to be misled and groomed, make anti-LGBT plus hate crime an aggravated offence, modernise gender recognition processes, appoint an international LGBT plus envoy. I don't know what most of that means, but it basically means we're all going to the gulag, I think, Toby. Like I say, Labour all over the map at the moment with their, which direction they're going to go. Yes, feels like they haven't quite agreed a common line on this. Um, I think we know where Starmer stands. He basically wants to change the subject, doesn't want to talk about it, doesn't want every single Labour spokesperson on TV during the general election campaign to be asked, can a woman have a penis? Because believe me, they're going to be asked and there ain't much he can do about it, but he's doing his best. Yeah, he's got to come out and just say, no penises. And be very clear about it. Um, although there was a whole thing in, in WPATH files about eunuchs. If you identify as a eunuch, that whether they should actually castrate you. So imagine the horrors of that. I mean, that's the WPATH stuff that's coming out. It's, it's so incredibly sick. Oh, but we don't have time for that, guys, because we've already done an hour and a half. And um, we have to go. But thank you so much for listening. Uh, the next live show is April 8th at the Hippodrome, Leicester Square. Soon you'll be able to go to, hopefully as you listen to this, you'll be able to go to eventbrite.com and eventbrite.co.uk or basedmedia.org and click the about or events section, I think it is. But uh, it, it may not quite be up yet, but it, it probably will be by the time you listen no, to this. It should, it should be up by the time you listen to this, yeah. So if you go to basedmedia.org, click on events, you'll be able to buy tickets for our next live show at Lola's downstairs at the Hippodrome on April 8th. And tickets are only £25. Unless you want to have a drink with Nick and me afterwards, in which case you can get a ticket and come for a drink for £75. Yeah, absolutely. And it was very funny last time. And hopefully I'll be feeling better the next time. And it'll be it'll be even better. And if you want to support me, it's buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon or nickdixon.net, my new custom domain for my Substack articles, 50 quid a year for, for all my articles, five pounds a month, pretty decent. Or just support us at basedmedia.org. You can sign up for five pounds a month for that, get all our extra content, including the Zoom call now and all our forthcoming shows and anything else we do in the future basedmedia.org and uh, Toby anything else you'd like to add? No just um, if you haven't yet joined the Free Speech Union go to freespeechunion.org click on join it's only 30 quid a year for students veterans pensioners 60 quid for everyone else Um, well worth it if you ever get into trouble we'll have your back all right until next week stay skeptical stay skeptical